All right. <clears throat> so this is going to be beam analysis. We require from buildings two kinds of goodness. First, the doing their practical duty well, then that they be graceful and pleasing in doing it. Just so deep. I feel so invigorated on this Monday morning talking about this. So we have talked about this before. A beam is a structural member that carries a load that's applied transverse to its length, meaning that the length of it going side to side, it's going to be held up in the opposite direction. Right? It's used in floors and roofs. It may be called a floor joist, stringers, floor beams, or girders. So you can see this uh, great set of people over here again. I don't know where they got them, but they are certainly quite interesting. And we have talked about <coughs> chasing the load as well, where the loads are applied over a small area. Maybe you're standing in the middle of these two uh, beams on the floor. And so what happens is that the load is transferred to the beam that's either closer to it or evenly distributed if it's in between. And then that weight goes over to the girder and then that goes down to the other building materials. So you have the, the weight right here, you have it go out and over to the girder, and then the girders are connected to the columns up and down. So we've talked about that before. This is what we are dealing with in a structural steel building. Um, your house at home works a little bit differently where you have floor joists that are all held together in one big system and they are sitting on top of bearing walls uh, that works a little bit different. So in, in the case of your home, you have a beam that's sitting on top of not a girder, but it's usually sitting on top of another wall. Uh, there are some instances where a joist is hung and it's hanging on something that acts sort of like a girder um, and then that girder would be then held up usually by either a post at a corner or another wall so works similarly just a little bit different all right so a static equilibrium is the state of an object in which the forces applied counteract each other so that the object remains stationary all right, basically, nothing is moving. The weight of the building is holding up the weight of the beam. A beam must be in static equilibrium to successfully carry load. So whatever force that we apply onto it, there has to be enough force going the opposite direction to help hold it up. If not, we have a, we have a difference in forces. We don't have equilibrium. The beam is going to move in the direction of the greater force. So if there is more load on top of it, it's going to be squishing down into the ground if there is not enough uh, reaction force to hold it up the other direction. Um, so the beam will deflect when a load is applied, but it will quickly return to a static condition. That is, it will stop moving. So when, when we would bring um, a two-ton pallet of rocks in here, you might actually see the floor dip down a little bit, but providing that the beam is going to, is enough to hold it, it would then stop moving. So when you move something really heavy over top of it, it will bend down a little bit, but equilibrium says that after a point, it's going to stop moving, and then it's going to find its equilibrium where it stops moving again. Uh, so when we're talking about it in terms of the beam, the load, which are the forces that are applied to the beam from the roof or the floor, must be resisted by the forces from the beam supports. The resisting forces are called reaction forces in green there. And note that the forces are often referred to as vectors because they have a magnitude and a direction. And I know from walking in and around Mr. Myers's um, Principles of Engineering class in the morning, that those guys are talking about vectors right now. So if you had POE, this is this should be uh, sort of a recapping for you a little bit of some of the stuff that you've seen before. If not, then buckle up, because you're in for a ride. So reaction forces, those are the forces that are holding up the beam. 
They are opposite to whatever force you are putting on top of the beam. A linear, linear reaction is often called a shear reaction. Um, so when we are, well, I'll, I'll skip that for right now. A rotational reaction is often called a moment reaction. The reaction forces must balance the applied forces. So in order to design a beam, we calculate the magnitude of the reaction forces. The reaction forces will also indicate the types and magnitudes of forces that will be transferred to the supporting members. So one of the ways that we are going to look at these things is how they are supported. Um, most of the time we are going to have a pinned or a fixed connection because what that does is it tells us that that point can move a little bit if it's a pinned connection um, and it doesn't it gives us two reaction forces so like a pinned connection over here has this reaction forces in both directions this way a roller because there should be no resistance going side to side only has the reaction force of holding up in the air. When you fix the support and it's mounted to the wall, then is when you have that moment reaction because the moment reaction is the turning or the twisting force of the thing wanting to sort of pull off of the wall. Right? Not only is it the shear forces of the force trying to pull it off the wall and the shear force trying to slide it basically off the wall. So there's my mouse over here. Um, this FY is as if it's kind of mounted to the wall and it just wants to sort of fall straight off the wall. So, uh, pin connection, uh, yeah, uh, yep, covered all those things. So here's the, um, here's the beam types. <clears throat> a simple beam is supported by a pinned and a roller connection. And so up here you see, remember if we go back again, the roller connection only has one force underneath it, that's the FY, and the pin connection has two forces, the FX and the FY. So if we look forward to this one, we have a roller connection on this side because it's only FY, and then in this one we have an FX and an FY because this is a pinned connection over here. So that's a simple one. A continuous one is when we have um, supports over uh, several supports there, and you see that it also starts off the same way and that it just has some connections up underneath here. There is no lateral F of X to show you that there's any sort of forces going side to side on any of these parts of the beam. And then we get to the cantilever, and the cantilever is when you have the... Um, three reaction forces there. You have the twisting or turning of the moment force, and you also have Fx and Fy. And you notice that the arrows are different sizes on this too, meaning that there is um, there's a twisting force that's definitely going to happen. If, if you imagine that this is like a springboard, like a diving board, and somebody is heavy at the end of this thing, it's going to make this thing want to just twist right out of its socket. Okay? There is not really a lot of force trying to pull it straight off the wall, but there is a lot of force that's going to make it want to try and slide straight down. Um, if you can imagine that you even put like a heavy weight right here on the, on the thing, very close to where the reaction forces are, then you end up with this heavy force that wants to be um, basically sliding it straight off the wall, which is why this is a larger arrow down here for the Y direction. So again, if we look at a fixed point on both ends, we're going to have a moment on each side as well. And if we have a propped up on one end and supported at the other, um, means it's going to have a moment on one side and nothing on the other. And then if it's overhanging, then we're just going to have the F of X and the F of Y underneath there like that. So we have the fixed beams, prop beams, and overhangs. So 
what we're going to look at is mostly going to be pinned connections on one side and then roller connections on the other side so that we are only looking at um, f of x and y on one side and then f of y on the other side. So this is going to be the left hand side is going to be the roller or the excuse me the pinned connection that's what that little triangle shape is going to is going to signify and then the right hand side is going to be the roller connection. So in the bottom half is what's going to be called the free body diagram where we actually start looking at the forces that are going to be on here, which is why we use some arrows and we use the applied load arrow on top there. We're going to look at a couple of different ways to do that. So when there's no applied horizontal load, you can actually ignore the horizontal reaction in the pinned connection. So unless we are told that there is some sort of force that's going to be pushing on it side to side, we can actually just get rid of that. We can ignore it. So we're going to just be mostly looking at reaction forces of the uh, F of Y type. Okay, so let me make sure again that I'm saying everything that I need to say here. Uh, yep. So this is, uh, this is the concentrated load, the applied load up here. Concentrated means that it's going to happen at one single point. We would call it a point load, meaning that Again, it's like when you drive that big pallet full of bricks right over top of one point in a beam. So it's a 2,000 pound load and it happens in a very, very small area. If you are talking about um, equally distributing all of those bricks across the floor by, you know, like putting a decorative brick floor over top of whatever we're standing on right now, or sitting on, um, that would be a... Uh, uniform load and that would be more uh, dispersed across it and there's different arrows that will will show you for that okay basically what you need to know on this one is again that everything must be equal the sum of all the vertical forces acting on a body must equal zero if not it's going to be moving in one direction and clearly we don't want that the sum of all horizontal forces acting on a body must be equal to zero. And then the sum of all moments about any point acting on a body must equal zero. So basically what you are going to try and do when you are looking at any of these equations and looking at all of the forces that are going into it, um, you're going to try and make sure that everything equals up to zero. And so if we are putting... 5,000 pounds of weight on top of something, we are going to be finding how much the reaction forces are in the different places that's going to equal up to that 5,000 pounds of weight pushing the opposite direction. The, depending on whether or not we have a single applied load in the middle, like the, um, the uh, concentrated load, or if we're going to have a uniform load that goes across it, it's going to look differently on either end of it. Um, but we'll talk about that as we keep moving on here. So when we talk about a moment force, the moment is created when a force tends to rotate an object. The magnitude of the force is equal to the force times the perpendicular distance to the force, the moment arm. So here's what happens. We have the force acting on the arm way out at the end of it, and then, so what we have is the um, distance to the moment arm, and we multiply that times the force, and that equals the moment. So, this relatively simple here. All we're trying to do is figure out, like, basically how far away it is, and then multiply that by the force, and then that's going to tell us how much of this moment we have. All right? Now, what I want you to do is actually, for one of the first times in this class, I want you to get something to write with, and we're going to take some notes here. Okay, so <clears throat> let's break down the parts of this again, just so that you can see what you have drawn versus what we were jo just talking about. 
First off is the overall beam length of 20 feet. We just have a, a long beam going across the middle there. We have a point A, we have a pinned connection, that's the triangle with the little lines down underneath it. And then over at point B, we have a roller connection, it's a circle with the lines down underneath it. We have two different reaction forces on top here. So up on top, at P, we have a 4,000 pound arrow pointing down, and that 4,000 pound arrow happens at 6 feet from point A, the resulting 14 feet from point B. Okay, So at, at P, we have 4,000 pounds coming straight down. W equals 650 pounds every foot across this to uh, this 20 foot length of uh, beam going across there. This is a beam diagram. This sort of shows you in real life what you are dealing with. Okay. Now, directly down below that and in line with it, sketch the free body diagram. And as you're sketching, I'll just walk you through the differences, which are pretty minimal. The only difference really is that we are now adding in f of x at a and f of y at a over here on the left. All the weights are the same, 4,000 pounds, 6 feet from the left at point a, 14 foot to the point b, and we have 650 pounds every foot for the W, that's the uniform load going across it. We have a point load at P, we have a uniform load W. And then on the far right hand side, we have F of Y, B. And remember that F of Y is the Y direction reaction force. And we have F of Y, A over at the other side, the reaction force on that point. So what we are going to do is we are going to calculate the reaction forces using this free body diagram. So let's start walking through some steps. Okay, so what you need to remember is that we are again going to try and get everything in equilibrium. Using, use the equilibrium equations to find the magnitude of the reaction forces. Horizontal forces. We are looking at just the horizontal force for a second. Assume that anything moving to the right is positive. F of x of a, do you see any reason why we have any forces that are pointing opposite to that? No. So it's zero because there are no other reaction forces. We have nothing opposing FXA. We have all going up and down if there was some arrow over here that pointed opposite of FXA, then we would have to have a, a reaction force to it. But we don't. We don't have any kind of opposition to the X direction. So we just cancel that one out. That one just becomes a zero. Okay? Vertical forces. Assume that anything up is positive. So we are again trying to get to a equilibrium. Uh, therefore, if anything up is positive, anything down is in the negative. Uh, that'll just become apparent in, in a couple of minutes. So the uniform load must be converted to an equivalent concentrated load. So what you see here, the numbers on the screen, FYA plus FYB, that is going to be minus 4,000 pounds minus 650 pounds over the 20 feet. That all has to equal zero. So that's our equation that we're trying to solve, basically, with our variables put into place. So how do we find what the uniform load is? We just multiply 650 pounds for every foot 
times the 20 feet of the total load. Okay? So we're only looking at the concentrated load for a minute. Uh, excuse me. We're only looking at the uniform load for a minute. We're looking at that 650 pounds that happened every foot in the diagram you just drew. And the, the beam is 20 feet long, so that means that 650 pounds for 20 feet equals 13,000 pounds. Now, you notice that in the second line down, we moved the equal sign. We need everything to equal zero, and in order to make that happen, we need to separate out our variables. This is like a math class going back to uh, Algebra 1 for most of you. Right? We need to get the variables on one side, and we need to get the real numbers on the other side so we can figure out how to do things. So what happens in the second line here is we put the equal sign in between our numbers. So FY, FYA plus FYB, that needs to equal what we have over on this side, 4,000 pounds now plus 13,000 pounds. You add those together, you end up with 17,000 pounds. That is equal to what we get for FYA plus FYB. Is there any part of that that seems a little confusing at this point? Okay, so the equivalent concentrated load of that 13,000 pounds, that's acting right across the middle. It's not acting closer to one side or another side. That's important when we're starting to try and find in the next slide how much is on point A versus how much is on point B. Okay. Right now, if you look at it, we're just looking at that the total of FYA plus FYB is going to be 17,000 pounds. Now we just have to figure out how do we get one versus the other because there's a there's a point load that's closer to point A than it is to point B. So they're not going to be perfectly equal. Okay. So we move on. <clears throat> Moments. Remember that a moment has that rotational uh, clockwise motion, counterclockwise motion is positive, but it has that rotational motion to it. So what we're going to do is use our moment diagram to try and figure out how much that point load is putting on one side of our beam. So the only way that we can really figure out what one beam is seeing versus another beam is to separate out how much weight is being applied to that to that one single point. Okay? So Again, and we have to add these things together to total up to 17,000 uh, 17, pounds. So we're going to look at point A in this example. Since FYA acts through the point A, it has zero moment arm. So it's not going to um, have, uh, have any like actual rotational motion. We're actually just going to look at the, the sort of beam arm that we have here, right? The 4,000 pound applied concentrated load and the equivalent concentrated load from the uniform load both cause clockwise rotation about a point A. So if you are looking at point A and you imagine the hands of a clock, it's going to be moving this direction because you are Basically, at this point, you're pushing down on it, and it's going to be moving down from the 3 o'clock down to the 6 o'clock. So from this line down to the 6 o'clock, sort of like that. And so therefore, the both of them are going to be considered negative because counterclockwise rotation is positive. So both of these are negative. We're going to try and find the opposite of that, which is the positive. Remember that the equivalent load, which takes the place of the uniform load, is assumed to act at the middle of the uniform load location. That's why the purple arrow is there now. So they basically took out all of the um, equivalent uniform load and they put in the equivalent single load, which is 10 feet away from it there. So 
the moment that is caused why FYB is positive, because FYB would cause a counterclockwise rotation from point A. So if we're looking at point B over here, and you are pushing on point B, it's going to go from 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock, which is in the counterclockwise rotation, so that one's going to be positive. Okay. Now, let's look at the numbers and try and figure out what they are telling us to do here. Top row, everything needs to equal zero. The forces at point FYB are um, FYB times 20 feet. That's the entire moment arm. And then, and this is in the positive direction. That's going to be minus the 4,000 pounds at 6 feet from the other direction. And that's going to be minus 13,000 pounds at 10 feet, which is from the equivalent concentrated load of that whole uniform load that we put on there. Add that to FYA times zero, and that equals, everything has to equal zero. Okay? Now, look down at the second line. We can simplify this over here a little bit by saying that 20 feet times the FYB minus 24,000 pounds per foot. So that's foot pounds. This is now torque. All right. We took, we took the 4,000 pounds and we multiplied it by the 6 feet. And since none of the um, units canceled out, we put them together. So the pounds and the feet now become foot-pounds. And then we multiply 13,000 pounds times 10 feet, and we end up with 130 foot-pounds. Now, the last time that you were taking off the lug nuts on your car, you probably had them tightened somewhere to about like 80 to 120 pounds per foot, foot-pounds of torque. Okay? You get a torque wrench or something like that, and you tighten them on there to a point where the manufacturer says, this is good enough. Um, it's not going to damage anything, but it's tight enough that the wheel's going to stay on. Think about the numbers that you are looking at here. 130 foot-pounds of torque and uh, uh, 24,000 foot-pounds of torque. That's just these insane numbers when you think about it. Okay? Now... Um, when you add that with zero, because FYA times zero, anything times zero is zero, so now we just have a zero over here, that equals zero. Okay. Now you go into algebra and you start moving the uh, equal sign over to the middle a little bit so we can separate out our single variable, and we put these together on the other side here. Now we're looking at 154 thousand foot pounds that's on one side 20 feet times the FYB is on the other side so you do a simple little rearranging to divide by 20 to get it off of this side which means that you divide by 20 on this side 154,000 divided by 20 equals 7700 pounds and because the feet and the feet cancel out we only are left with pounds. Feet and feet cancel out. Pounds are left over. That means that the force at FYB equals 7,700 pounds. So we only just found FYB over here on the right-hand side. That equals 7,700 pounds. Okay? Everybody slightly with me at this point? Not of a head. Okay. Now, the other side, because we know if we would go back two slides, we would find that FYA plus FYB must equal 17,000 pounds. And because we already know FYB now, now we're just going to do the simple um, subtraction to find that 17,000 minus 7,700 17, is equal to 9,300 pounds. So FYA on the other side is equal to 9,300 pounds. 
<coughs> so if you want to make yourself feel good about the type of math that you just did, if you were like me and you only ever got to Algebra 2 in high school, not necessarily proud of the fact, but I feel like I've made my way through life pretty well at this point, you just solved a linear equation, two linear equations, okay? Which linear equations are like upper, upper level math. That's like the stuff that you get to after calculus, okay? Because we just broke it down into simplistic ways to do it, right? So look at the diagram again and understand what we just did. We have a uniform weight of 650 pounds on every foot of this, and we have a 4,000 pound point load over here. So when you add all those up, the equivalent weight that is being pushed down on uh, each of these two sides is 9,000 pounds on one side and 7,000 pounds on the other side, roughly. Okay, And that would make sense because this point load is closer to one side than it is to the other side. It's not just 17,000 pounds and we just divide it in half and it goes equally to one side and the other side. There are some equations that are like that, and that makes it pretty simple, but we did one of the hardest ones here first, as an example. Okay? Um, and then, so... FYA, FYB, they require two equations in order to solve each of the variables. Um, all right. So now, this is the second part of the uh, of the uh, the equation, and that is that we are going to find what's called a shear diagram, and that is a a visual. And, and we actually do a little bit of sort of calculus to figure out what space we are going to use um, and how much weight that these things are going to take at their maximum load, so to speak. Okay, so I'm going to hit pause for a second on, the, on the, the video here, and I want you to draw what you see in this box. So, looking at this shear diagram, because the applied loads do not occur at a support, shear forces are introduced into the beam. That is, the particles of the beam try and slide against each other because the applied forces are pushing down and the reaction forces are pushing up. The shear forces get larger as you get closer to the support. The shear diagram is a way to represent the shear force at every point along the beam. It is really just a bookkeeping method to keep track of the vertical forces. So, if you start at the left end, point A, plot the magnitude of the vertical reaction force, that would be that 9,300 9, um, over there on the left. The internal shear represented by the shear diagram at the left of the beam is equal to the end reaction at the end of the left beam. That's basically saying that it's equal to that 9,300 that's up here, okay? So those two are equal. Um, in this diagram, one square is approximately equal to 300 pounds vertically. No, that's supposed to be 3,000 pounds vertically. Um, although it's not critical that you sketch it perfectly to scale. For uniform loads, the slope of the graph is equal to the magnitu magnitude of the uniform load. So the slope decreases, it goes down at... 650 pounds per foot length of the beam. So that's basically what this slope would be. Every 650 um, pounds for six feet uh, over the over the distance of the the total beam here. All right. So that's how we're getting this little slope up here. Then we have 4,000 pounds that are straight down because that is a point load. All right. I got to move down my thing here. So in this diagram, every square this direction is two feet because of the way that we're equaling this out. I don't know how, how exactly you did it on your paper, but that's what we're showing up here. So if you get everything exactly right, you'll end up down here at 7,700 pounds 
down on the other side, which will equal to your FYB force on this side. Okay? Now, we're going to look at what are you actually doing. So for pinned and roller connections, we know that there's no moment reaction. Therefore, the moment at a pinned or roller connection is always zero. Note that the moment at each end is zero here. So there's no moment force. There's no twisting or turning force. It's just straight up and down, right? Just canceling those things out, making sure that you know that there's nothing. The moment beam, uh, the moment diagram for a beam that has a uniform load is essentially parabolic. So it would essentially be just kind of like a bubble. Okay. Um, uh, you know what? We, we're going to have to stop here. So we're going to, we're going to hit the pause button.